we um, be, we we didn't terribly have Strathairn as part of our plan. Um, my father and I in 2013 visited here, and we really enjoy. We we really liked the feel of the distillery, and most importantly, we we really appreciated and valued what the the owners at the time were looking to achieve they were they were really focused on quality small small batch hands-on care and attention and quality but that was 2013 time passed and then in 2019 um, they contacted us and said we're, we're looking to sell the distillery on and thought it might be of interest. And it was not part of our plan, but we made it part of our plan because it just felt like a good opportunity that arose. We weren't desperate to become distillers. It's been a steep learning curve. Um, it's strange, it's one of these things where the company has been in the whiskey industry for 76 years distilling is um, sometimes witchcraft to us. It's, thankfully, Angela is excellent at her job and we let her crack on and, and manage the distilling side. Um, we also have an excellent operations director who's ex Beam Centauri. He is, he's actually just arrived, so you'll get the chance to meet him. His name's Mick Ord. But um, we are definitely still learning with distilling but um, we know the sort of whiskey we want to create and bottle and Strathairn for us is exactly as we wanted it to be. Ironically for Douglas Lane's first single malt offering um, this, the, the final product which you'll taste later, involved a massive amount of blending. So whilst consumers claim to hate blended products, blended scotch, blended malt. This required as much blending, if not more, as this did. Please have a sip um, and enjoy, I hope. The, we released, a few years ago, we released these, only a few hundred bottles of our new make for two reasons. One, um, we, we think the quality is excellent. Um, I've been in the whiskey industry since 2006. Uh, I worked for White Mackay on single malts like Jura and Dalmore and Fetacairn. Then I went to Morrison Bowmore Beam Centauri and worked on Bowmore and Glengarry and Ockintoshan. And all the time I got to try the new make spirit. I think this is the best that I have ever tried. I know I am biased, <laughs> very biased, but um, for me, the, the quality of the ingredients that we put into making Strathairn is very evident in our new make. It's got a, a wonderfully rich barley, creamy maltiness. Um, Angela, who will know it better than I do, says she gets lots of fresh fruits and strawberries. For me, it's porridge, it's cream, it's grist and barley. Um, I wish I could have more. I'm driving, so. Um, sadly, sadly only a sip, but um, without uh, spoiling the surprise too much, Tonight, we have a, a cocktail for you, which has been made with our new make. Um, and I, I've not tried it, so I'm, I am excited to try that and expect it to be very punchy. But I think the, the new make is a great reflection of the, the effort that is put into making a really quality spirit um, by, the t by the team here. And at both Douglas Lane and specifically at Strathairn, the wonderful thing is the, the nature of our size were not run by accountants. Um, whilst I really value and respect our finance director, he doesn't have a say in the end product. So our brief to Angela was 
create a single malt that is entirely as you, the distiller, how you want it. We, we, we gave her parameters that we wanted a really big, wholesome, indulgent, meaty style of Highland malt. Um, but she came to us and said, I want to use Maris Otter, which is really expensive and not the easiest to source. Um, she needs a really long fermentation time. All of this adds cost and complexity, but at every stage we've said, okay, fine, fine. Um, because we recognise it's a really competitive market. Um, we recognise Douglas Lane is rightly obsessed with quality and therefore what we produce at our tiny Highland distillery also has to reflect that. So I feel terrible because I'm teasing you about the end product, but for me, this was a nice journey. It shows you how the spirit is straight off the still. Tonight, you will get the chance to try this, our inaugural release of Strathairn, which has been matured in three different types of cask, sherry, bourbon, and virgin. And it just, again, goes to show the, the importance of a good wood man management policy and selection of great casks, um, both in terms of the colour, which I know is very important to consumers, and that is completely natural, but also in terms of the, the flavour. And by way of a, a preview, this has a wonderful, deep, spicy, dried fruits depth. Um, we're, we are really proud of it um, and excited to let you try. Um, European. Yes. Yeah. It's French. Yeah. Great question. I'll I'll ask Mick. Mm. He will know more. Um, the, the truth of how we created this was just not these ones, but hundreds of these samples. And I wish I could say it was terribly technical, um, but it literally came down to creating what we call pilot blends, where we were, again, it's, it's back to the, the art and the craft of blending. We were just creating all these samples and eventually landed on a few where we thought this is exactly on brief this is the big wholesome spicy impactful highland malt that we're looking to achieve and then worked back the way so i don't entirely know european and all the breakdown but we can we can find out easily it's a good question and not on our fact sheet <laughs> In the spirit of a journey um, and knowing that we can't let you try this till this evening, which just seems like we're teasing you, so apologies, um, I did think it might be quite nice to have a, a little dram of Timorous Beastie, which is our Highland um, blended malt from Douglas Lane. And within Timorous Beastie, we do, we do sideline quite a lot of our Strathairn casks. So it gives you a little, a little, thanks Chloe, um, a little taster of uh, Strathairn. Plus the fact that you're in the Highlands, um, I did suggest to the, the earlier group that you may like to take your drams, either of new make or indeed of Timorous Beastie and um, and head out to enjoy some highland country air in our either in our car park or <laughs> or uh, or indeed roam over um, or or indeed use this time to ask any questions that you might have. I've I've been asked all sorts by the other group. We went really off piste, so um, no, or no, we even had some off the record questions, which so. <laughs> Like what? <laughs> um, which distilleries are up for sale? I was asked. I was asked a bit about our further, well, I, I, further distilling plans. Um, so, and I, my understanding is there's quite a few distilleries that are are on the market or imminently going on the market. 
Yeah, I think some of the younger ones, yes. Um, I don't have any real specific names, just hearing little bits here and there. We, I was explaining, um, so we were, we quite publicly announced we would be building our Clutha distillery on the banks of the River Clyde. Mm. Um, regrettably, we were told the Clyde is, uh, the River Clyde in Glasgow is a huge flood risk. Um, it meant we weren't granted planning permission. So Clutha will not be built on the banks of the River Clyde. However, we have bought the stills or the copper for the stills. Um, we have the plans. We have a building that we own that we could make into Clutha. Um, but as I said to the earlier group, I'm a, a great believer in fate. And back in 2020, uh, 2019, just before COVID, we had a, a big decision as a business to make whether we focus our attentions on our all-encompassing operations site, which has bottling, warehousing, head office, or to build a distillery, i.e. Clutha. And at the time, we decided to build our own operations site. I'm glad we did now, um, because with the passage of time, I definitely want a second distillery for Douglas Lane. Um, would we buy another one? Maybe. Oh. We. Three. No, still two, ah. but Clutha, maybe yes, maybe no. Well, um, you could sell this cup of flour. Yeah, it's. A, money, right? Well, apparently it's a great investment. Yeah. Um, so. It's one of these things where Clutha or a second distillery is 100% part of our plan. And we have what I call our piggy bank, um, which our finance director loves. Um, the technical term. I know, I sure. I mean, it has a technical term, but I, it's, it is our distillery slush fund. And um, it has a time frame attached to it of 2026. Um, and we, we really want to have two distilleries, but we are, I think the, the bottom line is we are open to opportunities beyond Clutha. Clutha may still happen, but it's a very fast changing whiskey industry just now. It's quite, um, this year has been quite challenging. Last year was quite challenging. I am glad that we did not build Clutha when we did. Yeah. And that's where um, that line, and I don't know how well this will translate, so apologies, but what's for you won't go by you. Um, I really believe in that. And I'm, I'm, at the time I was really disappointed with Clutha. Now I'm a little bit relieved. Mm -hmm. So. We will see, but for me, success looks like two distilleries within my tenure at Douglas Lane. Right. Then I will pass over to the next generation. Yeah, um, I, think, I think it was early 2020. Okay. It, it was pretty immediate. We, um, you never talked about it, right? We, not massively, we added it to the back label um, so, I mean, this was bottled, I can't actually see, this is a recent bottling, but I think it was about 2020. Um, and we, we just subtly added it to the label and to the tube. I love Gordon and McPhail. We, we have a good relationship with them as a company. I, they are, they are the big boys, but we, we rival them, we look up to them. I understand why they are doing what they are doing and saying goodbye to their independent bottling business. I think it leaves a really interesting gap for us. We have amazing inventory. We still have Port Ellens, McAllen's, Laphroaig's, Springbank's, Ardbeg's. And I really want to keep them for the future. 
so I see Douglas laying with three strands, um, still an independent bottler with single casks, because I think we have a, a great stock and we can remain in that category. The second core part are our modestly titled Remarkable Regional Malts, which are a huge focus for the business. And then the third side will be our single malts, um, Strathairn and okay. another. So it's a, it's, it's a nice way to grow without radically changing the business. Uh, Gordon McPhail stopped being uh, an independent bottler because they lost a lot of contracts they had. How did you fail with this years? Do you still get everything you want? Or is it no, it, it is certainly becoming harder. Um, the nice thing for us is we have brands like these where we can, we, we can accept the trade names. So I can't give specific examples, but hypothetically, um, you know, we can accept the Ardbeg trade name because it's, it, it adds to Big Pete. Um, we still, we have good historical inventory of, you know, your Kalilas, your Port Ellens, your Blair Athels. Um, we still can access a lot of them. We, we have Talisker, which many independent bottlers don't. Um, and we're really appreciative to the, the big boys who supply us. Many of our filling programs were done by my grandfather on a handshake. And credit to the big distillers, they honour those, um, those contracts, which is amazing. Um, but it is getting harder, that is for sure, um, and involves us being a little bit more creative. So from time to the time we release uh, Big Pete's favourite and it is a single cask from Isla. It's big, it's punchy, it's smoky. It might start with an A, um, but we don't put the name because we wouldn't, we wouldn't play games. Um, so it is tougher, but I still see there is a, a good solid future for Douglas Lane playing in that independent bottling arena. I think before we bought the distillery, there was a lot of experimentation um, in terms of barley, certainly in terms of wood. It has been quite interesting at times, the, some of the casks we've inherited with Strathairn. Um, I think they sometimes used Maris Otter, maybe not all the time. I'm honestly not sure, she probably would know, um, but for us, when when Angela started with us and, and confirmed we should be using Maris Otter, she has essentially been given free reign to, to distill the way she wants to distill. We have total confidence in her and she's incredibly passionate. I'm sure it came through. Um, she's so passionate about this tiny distillery. She, she very much views it as her number one baby, maybe soon to become number two baby. But um, I interviewed with her for Craig's job and uh, I remember hearing her talk about, you know, this is my distillery and I'm not going anywhere. So don't expect to come in and take my job. How does that make you feel? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> um, but it's also for me, that's amazing to hear our lead distiller talk that way about here. So um, it's, it's her baby and I know she's very proud of it. Um, she scared the bejesus out of yeah. me. <laughs> I wouldn't get in a fight with Angela. Um, but I think her passion very quickly showed through. Uh, she, she interviewed with us the day before her, ma uh, her wedding. Um, I mean, any other bride is running around 
being a bridezilla and she was on the phone to me i can't remember if it was at the tail end of covid I don't, my my timing is gone but it wasn't face to face it was a telephone interview and she got married the next day and i remember thinking that's amazing not very good on us that we were asking for an interview the day she got or the day before she got married but um she's incredibly committed to here um i think even even when she is off having the baby, I think she will be here regularly. Um, but And she has a great team. Craig and Matthew are, are really good and really committed as well. So we're, we're very lucky because it's a very, as you'll have now seen, it's a very hands-on, labour-intensive process. It's a great... Um, it's, I view it very positively. It wasn't part of our recruitment plan, um, but it's, I, I was fortunate enough to work with Rachel Barry um, when I was at Morrison Bowmore, and I know Stephanie McLeod a little bit, and I, these women are so incredible with their nosing and tasting and their appreciation of whiskey. So um, it doesn't surprise me that we have a lady distiller, um, I'm, she, she's excellent at her job and, and for me that's first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, the fact she is a strong confident woman who you would not mess with is, is a bonus. Yes. She, yes. But it's, it, it has worked very well for us. How did you find the Timorous Beastie? Well, first proper whiskey of the day. What about the new make? Strong. Yes, it's punchy. It is punchy. And even, I mean, Timorous Beasties at 46.2, no, 8, sorry, should know that. Um, so still fairly high strength, but not quite the 68, 70% of the new make. Everything has to come together. I always remember when I was at um, Beam Centauri, the rule of thumb was 70% of the whiskey's character came from the casks that it was matured in, or cask or casks. Um, and I know my view is good wood or good oak um, can hide a multitude of sins. But ultimately, if you start off with great new make and a really solid quality wood program, you, you're, you can't really go wrong. Um, and I really, I, I, I recognise I am biased, um, not that I made it, but that new make I, I think is excellent. Um, and since we took on Strathairn, we've, we have focused heavily and invested a lot in good wood. Because um, as a business, Douglas Lanes, we've got a way still to go, but we're very committed to a, a really good wood policy as well. Again, it's where Strathairn, it's ironic that the amount of blending that has created this, but we, when we were doing all our blending, um, we did, we had a few horror stories where the previous owners of Strathairn had used a lot of firkin casks and you pulled the sample and it looked like Coca-Cola. So wow. Im immediately, yeah, every consumer is going, wow. And, and our customers in Asia are like, I want it. But then you try it and it's like, and I probably shouldn't say this, so apologies, Chloe. Some of them were like a really poor rum or cognac and it, the wood had gone too far and you had lost the true essence of the whiskey. It was just, it was just really woody and had lost all the soul of the spirit. So I agree, it's a, a really, it's a balance. Um, we some of them the better ones we blended away um a lot of them we we binned because we again we were like we can't 
we can't do anything with this, it's too far gone. We thankfully, because of the size and scale of the firkin casks, we're talking tiny amounts. So it, it wasn't like they were big sherry butts that we were having to disgorge and say goodbye to. But I, I think my view was they were too far gone. They were, I mean, they were literally Coke coloured and um, and it's, an, it's funny because we, in Douglas Lane, it's a real frustration when consumers are obsessed with colour. But this was a great example of colour isn't everything because it looked great, but didn't taste like whiskey and didn't taste like anything particularly quality driven.